the spirit of the Wendigo shall be unleashed. Oh, crap. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Survive Interviews. Today, I'm joined by two absolute amazing gents of the horror world. Uh, the phenomenal and wonderful Graham Resnick and Larry Fessenden. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Great to be here, man. This is fantastic. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, oh, look, when I started this channel, it was about horror gaming. And I think if you ask most people, a lo well, a lot of people, what some of the most influential horror games of the last decade were, I mean, Until Dawn is going to come up in there, like, hands down. So, yeah. major kudos. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Thanks for having us. Oh, look, and even then, as well as that, I'm on top of doing this channel and everything. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I got to kind of know Graham through that side of the world uh, and checked out his show Dead Wax on Shudder, uh, non-spawn right here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then, of course, Larry, you've created some of the best horror films like I you were the person that made me want to be an independent filmmaker rather than like I want to go out and make big Hollywood studio. It's like the creative control that you have in your projects is so phenomenal. Um, cool, man. I hope you can afford this uh, life choice. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I think I've been broke all my life, so I'm covering it. It's fine. <laughs> okay, well, and you're perfectly suited for our type of filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's great because even talking to people that have worked with you guys in the past, like when I've been to Fright Fest, I've met, you know, Jen Wexler and and nobody, like, it sounds like you guys have, like, a really close-knit family at Glass Eye Picks. Absolutely, for sure. And uh, Graham and Ty West were some of the first, um, the first wave and what I consider sort of the classic wave, and that gave way to Jim Mickle and the people who made uh, Stakeland. And, and then we've had a new wave with Jen Wexler and uh, Mickey Keating and, and you know, we, we keep trying to make fresh, independent-minded horror and just indie films that are interesting, often with a macabre bent. That's just the kind of thing that I'm drawn to. But, um, yeah, so uh, it's fun how Graham came to work on uh, 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 Until Dawn was because we were writing together. Uh, we were working on movie projects, Graham and I, and I was sort of helping him, you know, reading his scripts. And then we do what we call the punch ups, which is us sitting in a room going, well, what about this? Maybe we can make this a little better. And then um, right around that time, these guys from from England uh, called me and <laughs> interviewed me to do uh, to do a, a, a video game. And, and uh, just to tell the origin story right at the get go. I I know nothing about video games, and sorry to say that to your fans as they listen to this, they're like, "Oh, we're going to turn this off. Who's this old guy?" <laughs> I knew that Graham was not only a great collaborator, and of course, we'd worked on sound work together and been pals for various reasons. We already made one movie for Graham together. I can see you, uh, but uh, now as we were writing, uh, he came immediately to mind because. A lot of his references are uh, 80s movies and the lifestyle that he had growing up as, you know, tinkering with computers. Just that one generation um, younger than me where that was the jam, you know, to really figure out how to crack the code and play these early games. So we just started on this. Um, we wrote a spec script together that was for Until Dawn. And those guys were, I must say, quite charmed. With the... Uh <laughs> The Mike and Jessica sequence that survives into the PS4 version of the game is a little different, but uh, they had plotted it out and we wrote all the dialogue and all the scene work for that. And a lot of those jokes that we wrote around Larry's kitchen table in like 2011, 2012, <laughs> are when it ended up in the final, final game, which is so funny. That's super cool. That's uh, And it's funny because I remember following this game, I being a, a total gamer i remember when this was shown and announced as a playstation move game and i think it was the jessica mike sequence that they showed off in those trailers if i'm not mistaken yeah mm -hmm. and i i was so excited then 
and then when it kind of it disappeared for a little while and there was this kind of oh no is it gone have we have we lost that now and so when it kind of triumphantly returned it was uh it was a great moment i can imagine especially for for everyone involved with the project well we since we were in new york i was in new york at the time we were both in new york and uh we never saw more than little snippets of the game because uh, back then it's a little a little different now. But back then they could only send us tiny little like low quality quick times of little pieces of the oh, game. Wow. And so I think Comic Con 2013 they brought over a little demo of that section, and that's the most we ever saw of it. And it was right after that that they were like, you know what, we're gonna we finished we basically almost finished the game, but PS4 is so close. Let's retool this for a much higher res experience. Rather than being the a cool game on the last the the previous generation console, let's be at the forefront of technology on the next gen console and tell something even more cinematically and even more fun. And uh, so we we reused a lot of our old scripts, but um, yeah, it, it the, I always hear that the PS3 version got canceled, but it it kind of just <laughs> morphed into the PS4 version. So it it, it had a little dip after that initial um, uh, publicity, but um, it never really went away for us, at least. And we did a lot of. Uh... It was nice for me because I'm a New Yorker and hate leaving the house. And so everything uh, <laughs> was around. Perfect time for you, Larry. Uh, yeah, it was all. <laughs> and we did motion capture for the PS3 version, which was awesome. And I was in the dots and Graham and I had so much fun. And he was, uh, you know, sitting at the console with the guys and advising them. And it was really felt very hands on. And we were really making it. And then. It was strange. There was this lull, and we were like, "What went wrong?" And mm. the the next edict was was great, which was to strip away a lot of the dialogue and let's make it um, more actor based because the motion capture could really, um, you know, convey uh, emotions now. And that's why uh, we got this great cast um, a year later. And then and Graham and I just stripped out Such a cast. We have a lot of great <laughs> memories of, of the original characters because we would, uh, you know, because it had to be dialogue driven. They all had a lot of babbling and uh, we just have a lot of fond memories of some of the tropes. Yeah, because of the, <laughs> the third person or the first person aspect of the original, just so much of the banter of the characters had to be kind of like little expositional missives lobbed from off screen from all the characters. So we had to just constantly, we had to for each character in each scene, we had to think of 15 to 20 ways of saying, don't point that uh, flashlight in my eyes. And I swear we came up with the best stuff, the best. You will never see it though. It's, yeah, it's just know, imagine it's the best jokes you've ever heard. And the premise was like, you know, by the seventh one, it was just scatological or completely, yeah. you know, surreal. Cause they'd scale. Yeah. Because we yeah. figured no one would ever get there. Um, yeah. So it was really good it stuff. It was way more video gamey for sure, than the, the PS4 version is more like a movie that has video game yeah. elements. This was like, the original one was like a video game that had some movie elements. But I mean, I think it is ultimately for the best, but I still wish, and I've asked over and over again, every time I've been at Supermassive, uh, I want to play that old version. I know it exists mm. on some old development PS3 drive somewhere. They've got it. I know they do. I want to play it. <laughs> oh, I should also it's mention, I don't know if we've ever talked about this publicly, Larry, but we we made a, Glass Eye made a commercial for the Until Dawn for PS3. And it was right in that period after the game was basically done and going to come out. And so we shot this commercial upstate and uh, it was just like a crazy, goofy, bananas thing <laughs> that we did. And we basically finished it and then sent it to them and then didn't hear anything. So we were like... <laughs> Commercial <laughs> ruin the game. <laughs> oh, I mean, we still have that. I don't know. The, the video that we created was sort of tried. We tried to genericize it by just having random. I think they were non-SAG actors, and that was the idea. So yeah. the I mean, it was very local. Uh, were just uh, sort of generic teenagers that we had to do a few little things to suggest where we were headed, including have like a final girl running through a. Mm flaming landscape or whatever. And uh, it, it became very obvious that this was no way to pitch a show that had Remy Malik in it and all of that. So they well, really pre, pre that version. Yeah. Yeah. But I always wonder, uh, could we just 
play it as a novelty on YouTube, we got to talk to them sometime. We should find out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pretty but cool. The, well, I do um, think it's actually Larry it's cool. They, uh, to, all the stuff you're saying is answering a lot of the things that I was going to ask anyway. But one <laughs> of the things, <laughs> we don't really, Patty, we'll take care of this, okay? <laughs> 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 yeah you got it but one of the things that did that is it seems like everywhere i go online to look up uh how long the script was has a different answer uh, and i think that's because there was different versions of the game but like i just love to know how long was the script actually okay i'm gonna point something out if you look at my wall behind me you know what you don't see you don't see. See, look, you guys are dr- like, I'm not drinking. Larry's drinking, but I'm already <laughs> randy about this. There is no Guinness World Record on my wall. And this is a tragedy <laughs> because we have a Guinness oh. World Record for the stupid length of the script. It's not even real. It's a we have a Guinness World Record for a lie about how long the script is. The, the <laughs> we we did some interview where it they were like, oh, the, the extras on the game say that it's a thousand pages. And we were like, that's not, it's not a thousand pages, it's probably closer to 10,000 pages. And in saying that in the moment, I was being funny, but if you add up the, the <laughs> I looked at how long the PS3 script was, and I think it was probably, I remember it being probably somewhere between three and three and 6,000 pages, closer to 6,000, depending on how you formatted all that stuff. Um, cause we wrote it in Excel, which is a whole thing. I don't want to get into that. It was a nightmare. Um, just PTSD thinking about it. Oh, yeah. um, PTSD thinking about it. Yeah, I know it's awful. Uh, then the PS4 version was like between two and 4,000 pages. So when I said 10,000 pages, I was just kind of adding up the maximum for that. It's not what's on screen in the PS4 final thing, but, uh, Guinness did run, uh, in the 2016 edition or something. Uh, they have like their video game you know uh oh yeah world edition yeah so they actually gave us a guinness world record for longest video game script and in the print version it's a thousand pages but online they're like resnick has claimed that it's closer to ten thousand pages we couldn't verify this. <laughs> uh, but i've i've written them and i've asked for a uh a trophy. for a uh uh trophy thing. yeah and they've never written back so look uh patty we need your millions and millions of subscribers so i can just go i'll just go I'll just go up to the the Guinness store. Who, please? Oh, yeah. Like, hi, I'm here for Graham Racing's <laughs> trophy. <laughs> right. Oh God, I forgot that was the same. Yeah, um, go over there. <laughs> uh, and Larry, f- for you, um, I've I've really enjoyed watching your work as an actor in general, especially in stuff like We Are Still Here. But it was cool the moment when I was playing this game where I realized who the flamethrower man was. Was like, oh shit. Um, what was that experience like for you? Like from going from traditional, I suppose, traditional acting to this, I can imagine was, were you covered in, were you in a green suit, white balls all over you? Uh, no, they were green balls. Uh, okay. They're, no, they're green dots. And then you have a camera mounted on your face. But the best part is that you, first of all, you're in a huge like warehouse environment and there's tables just surrounding and you have just a blank space but you go into a room and you pick out your uh, your foam gun or whatever because they want to they are doing a loose, not really motion capture, but they are videoing you in case you do some action that they want to imitate when they're animating. Um, the, the motion capture was mostly the face and then the bodies were done separately in mm-hmm. England, but they use the, the actor's bodies uh, reference video reference. So anything Larry did would be yeah. replicated by someone else. And the cool thing is you really are acting with uh, the whole cast. I mean, when I burst into the room and I prattle on about the Wendigo, they're all there and we were all in this room. Uh, As for, you know, how that's weird or different, it's like asking a Star Wars actor what that's like. It's just, uh, it's part of uh, showbiz is when you end up in these green spaces and you're, you're telling stories, you're still just, you know, it's all about the imagination. I mean, it's um, it's not quite the method act, but uh, it, it, it's fun. And it, these, you know, all the kids were so great. It was really kind of awesome, especially looking back. Um, you know, they were actually substantial actors. I just didn't watch TV, so I didn't know who I was working with. <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't all. I mean, Rami hadn't done. He had done like yeah. Night at the Museum and Short Term Twelve, but he hadn't done like. Mr. Robot. Or I mean, he may have shot Mr. Robot, but it wasn't out yet. 
Oh, okay. Uh, I think it came but out later that year. I yeah. had a, I had a kid, so I had seen him in the museum movies. So to me, mm-hmm. he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and Brett oh, Dalton, yeah. actually, two of the actors, Brett Dalton and uh, Brett Dalton, who was on agent later on later on Agents of Shield, um, mm. uh, and uh, sorry, garbage truck outside. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, live TV, folks. Sorry. Um, <laughs> These things happen. We're going to commercial. Like I thought it was the beginning of a musical interview. <laughs> um, <clears throat> next thing you know, Howard Stern's going to come down. Uh, <laughs> On a crane, there's a pan over. There's a full, uh, full like a band over here, like playing off, <laughs> off the side of the screen. Um, what was I even saying? Oh, oh, Noah Fleiss, who played Chris, and yeah. uh, Brett Dalton, who played uh, Mike, were both in the PS3 version of the game. Uh, so they actually were with us in the original version, knew all the lines, knew all the characters. They basically had a dry run of the whole thing. Um, so it was fun seeing them again, and then the rest of the cast rounding out was just like incredible. And and I, I think it was. A trip for everybody because doing something that was so cinematic at the scale that we were doing it with these kinds of actors and shooting it like a film was kind of new for everyone and and uh i mean we definitely learned a lot of stuff <laughs> as we did it um <laughs> but uh yeah it was really fun and it was fun as a being there as a writer and just seeing how actors responded to seeing like variants of material and they would do a scene like six different ways and then you could see kind of how their their minds worked as an actor and director to seeing like, oh, that's how an actor interprets a scene in these different ways and kind of kind of shift into the different parallel versions. And it's good to, good learning experience for for all that stuff. But I don't think we can leave this conversation without noting that Graham also has a major role in the uh, in the Until Dawn. Graham, perhaps you could. This uh, is exciting. I didn't know. Uh, I don't remember any of my lines. Um, <laughs> I'm the radio announcer at the beginning because obviously I sound like a radio. Oh, DJ. that makes so much sense now. I just replayed <laughs> it like three days ago, and that suddenly <laughs> makes so much sense. <laughs> well, the which the is when they're coming up me. the mountain on the bus at the yeah. start. <laughs> yeah, I have a a weird piece of performance art, which is that I'm filling out my IMDb page to make it look like I'm an actor. When really, just every time I do sound design for anything, I put myself in as a radio DJ. Uh-oh. So um, I have like 14 credits, but I always pitch shift my voice much lower. And uh, I <laughs> couldn't do that when I was doing it for Until Dawn because I did it at a studio. So it's just a uh, high pitched me in the, in the radio. <laughs> um, um, La- yeah. Larry, do you remember your, your, your actual, the actual character's name? Have we ever talked about that from the original Wendigo? Jack Frost? No, Jack Frost. That's another guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plays the violin. Jack Burton. No, no. Uh, (laughs) Well, the thing that's tragic for me, and it's so tragic that I blocked out his name, but they had, when they interviewed me, so I go into this interview with these two Brits, and I really don't know why I've been called there. uh, And they start dropping names, like they say that the place takes place on Blackwood Mountain. And uh, I'm like, that's funny. And then they they name the uh, character uh, of of this Wendigo slayer, and it slowly becomes clear that they're talking about Wendigos. And Blackwood is Algernon Blackwood, who wrote Wendigo, a short story uh, from years ago. And I realize that the reason I'm there is that I've made you know a movie called Wendigo, a movie called Last Winter, a movie called um, Skin and Bones, all with Wendigos in it. So I'm sort of known as the Wendigo guy. The Wendigo guy. <laughs> Jack Fiddler is the historical yes. name of a famous Wendigo hunter from, um, from you know the 1800s who got all you know has been chronicled, and they were gonna name the character Jack Fiddler, and I was excited because I actually was able to say, oh, I know who Jack Fiddler is, and that's when I think I got the gig. <laughs> they were like this dude is so into the minutia of wendigo lore um in the end it's rather sad it seems that sony felt that they couldn't um you know that there'd be uh, the fiddler family would come after them <laughs> um so i was demoted to flamethrower guy or the stranger uh both of which are relatively charming, but not as fun as reference for this really historical character who you can look up and there's photos of him 
and he's just some badass dude who I guess killed <laughs> killed Wendigos. Killed Wendigos. That's a really cool story because yeah, like I mean, I I wasn't sure about. When I first played the game and you burst in and I realized it was you, immediately my mind went, Wendigos, that's why Larry is here, it's Wendigos. So I get what you're saying about the connotations that people draw, but I didn't know whether that was on Supermassive's part or whether it was you as a writer at that time. Like, I didn't know where the Wendigo stuff had came into it, so. Well, Graham can speak to this. The, there's an interesting history to the game. It was... Uh, well, Graham, I don't know how much we're allowed to say, but, you know, it was a whole other game sort of designed to be like a horror movie. But they didn't have that, that what I would say, the third act where it turns into a, a monster movie with Wendigos. And um, so they had just freshly came up with this idea. That's one thing that's so cool about Supermassive. The two guys that run the place really love their deep research. And they sort of they go into these different uh, folkloric, things and, and, and reference history and stuff. They're just they're uh, So they had imagined bringing this game back to life by adding this element. And that's when they thought, oh, well, we'll find some Wendigo guy. So it wasn't me and Graham. It was something that they had uh, introduced mm. into the structure of the game. And then we were required to, you know, write these characters and, and that situation. We just brought all the ridiculous jokes. Um, <laughs> the uh, the original original version I think was uh, London Studios and it was um, I believe a few years ago someone leaked the London Studios material which I had never seen before until well after our version came out but it was being uh, pushed in or just uh, written up about in the media as the PS3 version which it is not it was the um, mm. the original London Studios version that came out and it's like an hour of test gameplay and I think they're just like some similar locations and character names but that's about where the similarities end and i never saw any of that material um when we came in it was with supermassive already for a while and they um they had kind of retooled it as larry said and then and then we were brought in to kind of flesh it out it was so interesting to me because i was a game developer myself back between 2009 2012 making small little indie games with a little studio here in ireland but we knew supermassive back then and they, okay. had, they had just made like a little puzzle game where mm -hmm. you had your Tumble. PlayStation Move controllers, Tumble, and you yeah. had to, it was basically Jenga. And to yeah. see them going from that to like, as I say, when I saw the first Until Dawn trailer, I was like, oh man, we are so far behind these guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> we could never make a game of this caliber. Um, it was a crazy jump from a simple little puzzle game to a cinematic story, you know. Um, but then actually, you guys also worked on subsequent games of Supermassive Games. You, you, you worked on Rush of Blood and you, you worked on Man of Medan. Mm -hmm. And Mike. Yeah, and I should say, actually, I feel like um, uh, Rush of Blood, um, I feel like, Larry, your character in that is like an extension of the character you played in that little commercial that we did. Like that was that little ho the, the kind of the host character. That's true. I wonder if they were just like inspired or thought, oh, well, we'll do that. Like in the commercial, um, what we did is we found this weird upstate um, horror, uh, outdoor horror thing, like a Halloween. Headless Horseman. Yeah. Yeah. Where they would have, you know, a Bates Motel type of set. And as, as, a, as a visitor, you would go in and you'd have sort of a real life experience. Somebody would be screaming in the corner, like a haunted house. Um, it was a haunted, haunted hayride yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah. It was, cool because we were able to use those sets as if we you know built an elaborate set and then my character was kind of this um you know this host character sort of teasing the audience that there was this great game to play i don't even remember but just like the poor little children are all going to be slaughtered and you must uh, mm. visit so that when oh, you lived in the uh, the castle from last days gus van sant's movie well it's amazing yeah so that was what? in the what <laughs> So we filmed the first two shots there and I had, you know, cards and it was all about fate Big and fire. And a, yeah. No, that's like, crazy. It, uh, Graham, we've got to see if they'll let us just release it. It's so random that why not? Uh, but anyway, so from there, they sort of devised this idea of an evil clown host um, for a much more straightforward. What do you call that? It's a roller coaster like game. A 
roller coaster. Yeah, like VR. Uh, it's funny because I was playing Man of Medan with um, my friend Andrew Brooker from Fright Fest. Uh, we're actually putting up a, like a, a let's play of us playing it together. But we were talking yeah. about the the Peter Stormare character from Until Dawn. And then we were talking about the guy in Man of Medan. And then Brooker said, he was like, I think my favorite one of these was Larry in Russia Blood. Like of the kind of host characters in the games. Good taste. There's, yeah. <laughs> I got an award for that. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I can't remember what it was called, but it was wonderful to be. And I was going up against like Mark Hamill and so on. You know, it was quite great. Um, <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, so we got some acknowledgement. But more importantly is I turned into a giant molten lava penis, which is not something every actor can say. I don't think Robert De Niro ever turned into a molten lava penis, I might add. So uh, it was <laughs> really a great, fun experience. And once again, Graham and I writing these preposterous, uh, teasing lines. <laughs> Do you find that there was a freedom to, to writing uh, for games where like with film sometimes i don't know i'm only speaking from my own experience where you have to kind of rate sometimes rein in your your thoughts because you know what you can actually do whereas if you're writing for a game did you feel like oh we can have kind of carte blanche and we can kind of whatever we can dream up they can make appear on screen um did it affect that side of the process at all i'm waiting uh, for you to answer graham <laughs> 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 it's it's a it's sort of a yes and no because the way that our relationship with Supermassive has worked has been that they have we've often consulted at the outset on plots and ideas and storylines and then they design the scenes and the structure of the game um, and that what they do they do what they call spec so they spec it out so every like beat of the game has like a a spec request which is like um, it's like a giant flow chart and then we have to fill in the dialogue and the scene work within every little piece of the flow chart. So there's not a ton of room to suddenly be like, Oh, okay. Now we needed like the, the scene to take a wild left turn and like lions jump in through the wall and, and tear everyone to pieces. Can't really do that. Um, at that stage. Uh, but what you can do is from a, a more sort of emotional character perspective, feel out like, all these different versions of a scene that you never would in film. Like you in film, you may run through that in your head, but there's always one static traditional linear version of a scene. And that's the one that plays out. But in, in video games, it's like, Oh, there could be 50 different versions of the scene, depending on how you've come into it, how you're going to go out of it. What, you know, in until dawn, uh, what characters are alive or what characters are not alive in something like man of Madan, because of the multiplayer thing, there are, two sets of characters that are being controlled by the audience. So the uh, permutations of dialogue there are just like wild. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you're still kind of constrained by the needs of the plot and the needs of the formula of the game, because that stuff's so intense to make. We can't really, we don't have a lot of leeway, but you can do a lot within mm -hmm. that. And that's why this discussion of the 10,000 pages isn't, entirely facetious because it really felt like we did explore um you know 20 different emotional tracks for the characters you know uh graham is much better at recounting all the details but you know when the guys uh you know he's got the the two people are uh, facing each other and they, she's got the gun or he's got the gun he's gonna yeah. shoot you know that that was it's an amazing, mm -hmm. um, elaborate alternative and emotional. You know, we tried to be emotionally real. I think that was the success that we brought to Until Dawn, and it's why they came to me and Glass Eye Picks. They they had liked our approach to horror, which was sort of uh, emotionally uh, grounded, uh, mm -hmm. not just sort of exploitation. So we tried to bring that to these choice points where it really is like, what would it be like if your choice is to kill yourself or your girlfriend? And then really play those scenes out with a certain amount of sincerity. So, uh, and I think that's what audiences were able to hook into and that's what made it fun. 
I, I definitely would say that, like, thinking back on my own experiences of the game, it's really funny because I have all these friends that tell me, oh, I've played it 10 times and I've done all the different choices and branch points and everything. But what I find is I can't do that because I get too emotionally connected to stuff that I'm like, I'm not going to let that character die just to see what happens. I can't. I get too I emotional that, about it. Say that. I love that you say that because I always felt that too. Uh, once again, being a little more naive about video games, I was always advised that you can play the game and just do the snarky answers to each question and just basically be an asshole and then see what happens. But I always found that so distasteful that uh, in a way, you know, I was always on the same track. Um, but yeah, I, no, that's it. I, I could replay it 10 times. And, and you're always, I, you always end up making the same choices. <laughs> I had a... A funny experience where when I first went over to do some of the press for Until Dawn with Will Biles, who's the, the game director, they sat me down in a room. This was about a week before it came out. They sat me down in a room. I'd never played any of it. And I was like, OK, I'm going to play through the whole game and I'm going to make all the choices, the bad choices. I'm going to shoot the squirrel. I'm going to be a jerk to everyone. I'm just going to like <laughs> burn every bridge and, because when I have to play this again, when I go home, I play it with my wife. She, there's no way she's going to do She's going to be like, you know, she's going to, of course, do the nice thing because that's who she is. So, of course, I play through that way. And then I go home two weeks later and my wife's like, yeah, shoot the squirrel. Yeah. Screw all these people. Blow up their relationships. Everything's <laughs> chaos. And I was like, oh, my God, I did not know this about you. So I, I always feel like the game reveals things about the people you're playing with. Uh, absolutely. And uh, one of my favorite things about my mother-in-law was staying with us at the time that the game came out and she was kind of just chilling on the couch uh, watching me play games and she watched me play Until Dawn and it was the most interactive one-player experience I've ever had because I'm sitting there yeah. trying to make my choices and stuff and she's going, do this, do that. Like she's advising me, um, which as I say, I don't think, if I'm playing a shooter, she's not going to get that invested but I think because she is engaged and cares about the characters as well. She's like, don't fuck this up. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there was a, a a very specific moment that I can point to, and I think, Larry, you probably remember this, uh, where we realized the game had legs, that it was like, oh, this is going to work with people. And it was when Pete Samuels, who's the head of Supermassive, um, was demoing the game on screen. And I think it was the Hayden Panettiere running around uh, in a towel sequence, like where she's being chased. Um, and it's a lot of like, hide in the closet or go under the bed. And he was doing like a 10 minute presentation at PlayStation experience 2014. It was like just before the game, came, a little while before the game came out leading up, maybe earlier 2015. And, you know, it was a huge crowd of people and he couldn't get through just his normal presentation because every time a choice point came up, the whole audience just started screaming out what he should do, <laughs> like hide under the bed or go, you know, and basically a crowd of a thousand people or whatever it was, played the game through him and he just had to go, all right, I'll just play the game for you. And it was like, oh yeah, that's a game like this is that it's the game where in a horror movie and you're telling people when you're yelling at the screen and saying, don't go in the basement. This literally is the game where you get to actually experience that and make those mistakes and realize that those characters in the horror movies aren't thinking straight and they're under <laughs> duress and they're, you know, they're, you know, they're panicking and then you panic and you make mistakes and you hit the wrong buttons and you fall into a meat grinder as you do. <laughs> As one does. What is the? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Larry. No, I'm just agreeing. As one does. <laughs> uh, as I say, I've just started playing Man of Medan in co-op with uh, Broker for the channel, and Medan, I'm a lot more prone to make choices based on what I think the character is like. So the example of that that I'll give is that I think Sean Ashmore's character is a bit of a dick. So I play Sean Ashmore's character like that. Whereas there's obviously a choice not to, but it's just whatever it is about the way that I perceive Sean Ashmore's character in it, probably from seeing Sean Ashmore and other stuff and playing other stuff with like uh, Quantum Break, I just make these kind of assumptions that like, oh yeah, he's going to be an absolute dick about this. But it's like, I'm making that choice. Like I'm making Sean Ashmore a dick. Um, but yeah, the, the multiplayer component of Man of Medan is really interesting. And I imagine that that had to be fairly tricky as well to kind of, for you guys, that all, all these things are going to be happening simultaneously. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm just <laughs> reflecting on the, the experience of that game was was really a long journey. Um, there were a couple of different developers, and so Graham well, all, and, all super massive, but internally. Well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, guys, you know, mm. oh yeah, uh, assigned to the task, and uh, we were even over there and um, face to face and sort of getting excited about the game and its potential and. And there was a lot of uh, mythology involved in it that we got Graham and I dove deep into. And then they, I think they sort of ended up stripping some of it away. I mean, we were sort of primed to make another Until Dawn that was that rich and that sort of expansive. But in truth, they were picturing this as part of that series, whatever it's called, Graham. So they didn't want to get quite as invested and and so it changed a couple times for us. I mean, it was really fun doing the research. Um, and, and in the end, I think it became about the, whatever it's called, the dual play. That sort of became sort mm. of in a way the, the real motivation of the, of the design of the game. And it was fun. I mean, but uh, just one of the, every, every game has a different experience, you know. Definitely. And I, th I think like, uh, it's very hard as well. It, it's, it's like a, a band that releases that incredible debut album yeah. that like everything's going to be compared to that afterwards. And uh, I think that, so for a lot of people who went into Man of they were expecting it to be another Until Dawn, but it was, it was a sh shorter development time. It's a smaller game. It's, it's, it's price cheaper. It's meant to be a small anthology game. So I think that a lot of people weren't they didn't understand that. They just thought this is until dawn two. <laughs> no, Without you know, and actually, it's interesting because I remember when those guys, um, he and Will, told us that through whatever their research, that it was going to sell better to have shorter games. And I remember feeling depressed because it seemed like the success of Until Dawn was its immersion and the the commitment mm -hmm. that you have to the characters and everything. Um, and then, but this was just going to be a slightly different uh, model. And as you say, it was also an anthology. Uh, mm -hmm. So there were going to be other games similar. I mean, all of which seemed appealing at the time. Yeah, um, uh, yeah it was and, a, a different experience and, and had different goals. And uh, the tone is a little different too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it is such a Wild West type of project where I, I just don't know of anything that's attempted that scale of multiplayer interaction and in at a cinematic branching dialogue level, um, that it, it makes sense that narrative and dialogue and character are in some ways, and this is not at all a negative in some ways, secondary to the mechanics of that working. We did what we could to, uh, uh maintain a level of, character arcs and trajectories through that um every time you do a game you wish you knew what you knew at the end at the beginning um but i still look at what we did on that and go oh yeah that worked out pretty well like i'm really happy with how these things combine and how this plays out and it because it was just such a like yeah when we're doing this on paper uh before they've built everything we're just like i have no idea how this is all going to fit together later we're just trying to anticipate how these conversations are going to mesh and what the actual user experience is going to be like. And it's a, uh, so it's a wild new, new space. And the other thing that, um, you know, Supermassive does so well is just choose and create these environments. I mean, I just love it on an aesthetic level, the, the ambition to have the underwater stuff. And, and I, you know, that's what I love about until dawn is that lodge, the setting and all of that. Mm. Um, I'm sure you're aware that there, all the posters in the cinema room, the cinema room, cinema room, <laughs> which is what they called the theater in the, in the lodge, uh, where she goes through. But, uh, all those posters are our movies yeah. uh, from glass eye picks, which was just so. Well, except for, except for our movies, all the movies except for our movies. ours were included. <laughs> Graham and my movies. What was that about? Uh, but <laughs> they, they were very, uh, affectionate towards glass eye um back yeah. in the day and with all those little easter eggs it was very sweet but uh, 
I think that the, there's something about, yeah, like with Until Dawn, it's, I, I'm a horror fanatic. I've been a horror fanatic since since I was five years old and I accidentally snuck in and watched Nightmare on the Street with my grandma. <laughs> um, and I, when I played Until Dawn, it didn't feel like a cynical thing that was, was like, oh, we know what horror kids like. It felt like it was made by people who love the genre and understand the genre. And, and sometimes they say, especially in gaming, you don't get that. You do get a very cynical approach to that type of subject matter. But even... even I mean, if you could speak a little bit to this, but like, I love how you guys played with tropes. Like, you really played with tropes in it. it almost as much as stuff like Scream and Cabin in the Woods did, where you have this expectation about a character that they're stereotype. And then depending on how you play it, you come to realize that you're completely wrong. So that was, I mean, messing with the tropes like that was so amazing. Well, thanks. That's. I think that's. that was the thing that, that Larry and I worked, I think, most specifically on in the way that we tried to shape characters across the the experience of playing the game is setting up a set of expectations in the beginning about who everyone was and what role they filled. And then through the actions of the game, which was a lot of which was Supermassive's uh, part, we would then shift who those characters were so that you might ne- like absolutely hate Mike at the beginning, like, but jerk, jock, asshole. And then come to realize, oh, he's not that bad of a guy. He's just put up this mask and he's just acting in this way. And when, when the shit hits the fan, the way that you are, what you're bringing to him shifts him towards a better person or a better character. And so you can lean into tropes by what you're, what you're doing, or you can kind of steer away from tropes by reacting to things naturally. Yeah, no, as I say, I mean, genuinely such a, like, alongside, as I say, kind of, when I think of iconic, you know, horror stuff that does bend tropes and play with them, like, Until Dawn is well up there um, for me. Uh, I was going to ask you guys if you were gamers, and I think Larry already answered his that question, and Graham, I, I have a suspicion about you because we're friends on Facebook, and I see a lot of your Animal Crossing posts, <laughs> so I have a suspicion uh, yeah. that you are a gamer. <laughs> Just Animal Crossing. It's the only one. Just only Animal one Crossing. Yeah. It's the only game you no, need. Actually, well, <laughs> since since quarantine started, it's the only one. I got Doom Eternal. I, I literally bought a new monitor. It's right here. This big new new PC monitor to play Doom Eternal on. I was so excited. I finally have a gaming PC that I work on. And uh, the quarantine started. I just I can't. It's just too intense for me right now. So I've just been yeah. playing Animal Crossing with my daughter and Zelda and Breath of the Wild. But yeah, no, I'm a big... Uh, big gamer i grew up playing um computer games more than console games i didn't have an nes all of my friends did so it was easy to play a lot of nes growing up um ty west who i grew up with was a huge gamer growing up he's not as much anymore but he was the biggest gamer i know uh had every system had the jaguar had the turbo graphic 16 he had all all of the weird ones uh the uh i think he had a dreamcast maybe that was a little late uh, he had a 3DO. Uh, I mean, he had like all these random ones. Um, and we would go to the arcade and just play games for hours. Um, but at home, I only had a, a computer. Um, and uh, I played all the Sierra games growing up. So I was really like an adventure game guy growing up, which are much more narrative. And honestly, I think if anything, Until Dawn and the other Supermassive games are in the tradition of classic adventure games, ca- classic point and click uh, adventure games. They feel like that to me when you're mm. walking around with the characters. Um, so I stopped playing games for a little while in college because I just felt like I was not going to be a filmmaker if I just spent all my time playing games. Um, so I kind of miss, I have a black hole period of games from like 2000 to 2008 where I played stuff, but not as much. Like I played Tony Hawk and I played Portal but I didn't play any Halo um, at all because that was a ran that whole period. Um, so there's this like big chunk of time that I'm like missing, which has always nagged me because there's, it's a kind of cultural reference in games that I, I don't really have. But at 2008 or it's like 2011, really when we got the gig for until dawn, I was like permission. Now I can play games all the time. <laughs> it's all research. And you know, 
the funny thing is, uh, and I'm just like not a gamer. I don't even know half of what Graham just said, but there was a time <laughs> in the, Animal Crossing there. In the 90s when I would be in like a, a video class or something, I went to NYU undergraduate and they would talk about laser discs and that you'd be able to jump from chapter to chapter according to, you know, the, the audience choice. And it was sort of this early stumblings at the fantasy that you could have a choose your adventure in a movie setting. And, you know, there was a couple of movies like clue maybe where you could somehow i don't know there was at least the fantasy that you were affecting the end of the movie so that always appealed to me and i i always say that technology didn't really develop because what it did is it veered off and turned into video games and then it took decades for video games to get the kind of uh, clarity of image that could be taken as a narrative adventure and then have your branching. So it's just funny, my generation, there was that tease that somehow, you know, laser discs were going to make this all possible. And, and so I was always intrigued at the idea of, um, of movies or, you know, storytelling that had branching. And then it was just very sweet to sort of arrive at this moment, not only, you know, but also the the fulcrum between PlayStation three and four that had its own uh, sort of refinement moment, uh, and and here we are making this game. It was really a real treat for me, who never thought I'd be involved in video games. But somehow the the dream of uh, uh, you know interactive cinema came true for a moment. And I, you know I should say too, we, we've always thought of place to, of uh, until dawn as. On one hand, a video game or, or a cinematic video game, and on the other hand, interactive narrative. And they are they can be two different things, and they also can kind of intersect. Um, there's a whole way to think of how to separate the two, but um, I, do, I genuinely don't think that they had intersected so well until about 2014, 2015, Until Dawn being one of the games, um, but lots of other games like it, like Life is Strange is another one that is very cinematic, but also a video game. So it's partially interactive narrative. It's partially uh, a cinematic video game. Sam Barlow does a lot of work. Her story is and another one. The the Telltale games kind of yes. started to appear in that time frame as well. And yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the, so the Telltale then, games felt like you were playing through like a graphic novel. I choose your own graphic novel i think that was the difference whereas until dawn felt like as you say it was still a game it was still like a, a lucas arts point and click adventure but with the clarity and quality of a movie yeah um so Larry, were you, i'm uh, not sure what oh, oh no, sorry go ahead. Uh, i was just gonna say uh were you referring to dragon's lair the don bluth uh game the laser disc game or do you remember that was a classic uh, Laserdisc game. Oh, that's sweet. No, of course I don't remember. I don't have a clue. Although I, <laughs> yeah. I, I like a picture called Dragon Slayer. That sounds just like up my alley. Yeah. It was uh, also an arcade <laughs> game that was famous for eating quarters because it was uh, nearly impossible, but incredible animation by Don Bluth. Oh, nice. It was. And I think the animation was done in Dublin. I think Bluth Studios was still oh. here at that time. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think we've, I mean, I think we've covered a lot of stuff here. I don't want to keep you guys forever either, which I'm kind of doing, so I apologize. But uh, I guess just uh, to kind of close this out, what would you say is kind of like, in in regards to the games that you've worked on, what are, what, what are some of your proudest moments um, within Until Dawn or, or, you know, Rush of Blood or any of the things you've worked on? Well, I just want to say quickly, because... I would like to point out that Graham continues on in this world and I've retreated back to the old cinema. Uh, but, um, you know, we haven't talked about, uh, of course, I don't even remember what it's called, Graham, Hidden, you know. Oh, Hidden Agenda and the Impatient, yeah. Hidden Agenda, well, the Impatient was cool and that is related to In Until Dawn. So that was another one we did for Supermassive. But we did this film noir. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, so by all means, tell the fans, The Impatient yeah. is, is another cool um, awesome. 
you know, it's got Wendigos and everything, although I guess yeah. that's a spoiler. But it's, um, a, it's a it's a prequel to Until Dawn about oh, the, um, cool. the sanitarium uh, and it's all in VR, which is awesome. So it's like you're a patient at the sanitarium. How did uh, I miss that? I totally yeah. even when I got the VR like and I was getting everything. I don't know how I missed that. Oh, check it out. Yeah, it's so it, it's more of a proper Until Dawn tie in than Rush of Blood, but it's not called mm-hmm. like Until Dawn, the inpatient. It's just called the inpatient. So you could miss that it's a tie. I think they were trying to like surprise people, maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah, but uh it is definitely a straight prequel to Until Dawn. And it's pretty bananas. It's like seeing, you know, yeah. how the affliction started. I mean, it's truly uh, fits into the history of that uh, game. So that's a good one for the fans to check out. And then uh, an entirely separate title was Hidden Agenda, which was our film noir. And we spent a lot of time on that and a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, I don't know. It was just another, it was really cool to be not even in the horror genre anymore. So we were borrowing from uh, film noir tropes. It's like a cop story. There's a serial killer. It's more like uh, seeing seven. Um, and whether or not it succeeds a hundred percent, it's just another example of how Supermassive created these really atmospheric games. I mean, I'm proud of that aspect of it and everything that Graham and I tried to do with the, the story and the the themes. Another thing we were really working hard on for that one was to sort of bring a unity to a game that they set up as, you know, a series of sort of set pieces. But we really had to, our task was to make it feel like a compelling, gritty drama. Um. I think actually Hidden Agenda is one that I've seen on the PlayStation Store a bunch of times and it's got a really interesting cover, but I've never took the plunge. But I think now I've been, now I've got to basically go in and get the inpatient and Hidden Agenda. So, uh, because as I say, I didn't know the inpatient was related to Until Dawn at all. I actually didn't know either of them were super massive games. So hopefully, in one sense, hopefully a lot of people that are watching this are similar because hopefully this will be a chance for them to discover those games that would be great because it's always nice when you get that new discovery well, um completionists as i am you have to sort of uh you know you <laughs> at least get the impatient because that's part of your until dawn shelf uh and <laughs> then, uh, see if hidden agenda floats your boat it's it's pretty cool yeah, is that actually, a live uh, action or is it like it's, like until dawn it's like until dawn but without the adventure game aspect so it's only dialogue and choice points um but it's also it's shorter it's like a two-hour game um and it uh it uses something that sony was pushing at the time which i think they don't they haven't really developed further which was an app you so you play it on your phone and connect to the playstation and you you if you play, play with like four or five people yeah play link you can you can uh, uh yeah. vote on choices so they actually took that experience that pete samuels had at playstation experience to heart and made it part of the experience of playing this game I don't know how well that succeeds or not, um, but it was fun to write. And that's another one where what we wrote and what I think ended up in the game, there's some differences uh, just because of the development cycle and and budgets and things like that. But I think, um, you know, it it still works for what it is. And it's a really fun, interesting, like Law and Order style procedural that you can interact with, which is really cool. And Katie Cassidy stars in it from like Arrow and, and the CW shows. Very cool, and Larry, you you said uh, yourself there that you've you're you've returned to the world of film, um, which I have to say I'm very grateful because I was at Fright Fest last year with my movie, and I got to see Depraved, and I was me and my wife watched it together, and we were f- fucking amazed. No bullshit, we loved it so much. Thanks. And similarly, Graham, Deadwax, uh, we binged it. We loved it, and we want season two, so I'm just going to keep hounding Shutter until they make it happen. <laughs> yeah. They're fucking but, close. I yeah, mean, exa- they don't listen to you. Yeah. Super fan. Super fan. <laughs> Patty, what is the... What is but, the uh, I know Larry... You, for, you, oh, I was going to say, I know your your film was going to premiere in L.A. in, in March, right? Is it? Uh, are there any like new plans for that, or is it going to come out online? Uh, oh, it's on VOD in oh, the right, States yeah. now. Uh, uh, so it's it's up on all the VOD platforms, I believe. Uh, distributor called The Horror Collective put it out 
Cool. Uh, it's the first film I've done that's had a, what I consider a proper release. Congrats. That's awesome. Directing being like, <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I, yeah, uh, I was supposed to come to LA for, for on the 7th of April and obviously with everything that happened in the world that did not happen. So probably for the best, I'd probably still be in LA. <laughs> but, mm, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, next time uh, you'll, you'll be back again, I'm sure. And, uh, oh, it's- and we'll get a drink. Definitely. My first ever trip to the States was in January and I went to Kansas City for Panic Fest and uh, I had an absolute blast. Kansas City is a, is a great place to... to oh, I've never like, been it's an interesting one for like somebody who's never been to the States to not go to New York or not go to LA to just land in Kansas City. Like, right in the middle. Talk about fish out of water. Um, but uh, what I was kind of getting at there, Larry, for you is that like we talked about kind of your proudest moments with the, with with kind of within the gaming sphere, but I, because I'm also a filmmaker as well, and I love film. Like, what are some of your? I mean, what are some of your proudest moments as a filmmaker? Uh, well, I find filmmaking generally humiliating, and you know, you're just trying to, uh, you know. But Same. but I, I was um, I was grateful to finally just say fuck it and made depraved with a considerably smaller budget than I had imagined and a a less noteworthy cast, though I think my thespians are fantastic. But, you know, I had imagined it as more of a prestige picture where uh, some actors of of note would would gain to be in a horror film and that it would be elevated and all that, all these terminologies. But in the end, I sort of realized my place is on the edges of, uh, of, of, Hollywood and and the showbiz and so I just made it uh, from the heart and so I'm pleased with um, sort of learning my own lesson that's how I brought up all these young filmmakers and tried to get people to just shut up and make their movie and stop whining about their budget so I had to learn that lesson again for myself and in that regard I'm I'm very uh, grateful that I was able to have that moment of clarity and just go for it it's still hard to find no money, but um, it's better than waiting around for real money. So mm-hmm. that's, and I will say, since Graham is here, you know, I, I'm so sort of battered by showbiz and that I just, I didn't really take anyone's counsel. Of course, the wonderful people who helped me make the film, but I stopped even listening to them when, you know, I just edited it. I made my own choices. I wanted to get as true to my own vision as possible. And then I was about to picture lock and I sort of had a slight panic and I sent it to Graham and I said, will you please just tell me I'm not crazy so that I can picture lock in peace. And I'll never, ever forget. I'm almost getting weepy eyed. I got this email from Graham and it said, A plus, 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 plus. (laughs) And it really gave me permission to say I'm done and I can go to my mix and I'm I'm ready to to finish the movie. So thank you, Graham. I didn't. You're well. I didn't know so much hinged on that. I would have written a uh, slightly wordier email. Uh, <laughs> maybe I put a few more pluses in there. You no, know, you. <laughs> so about the third act. No, but uh, no, it really was uh, as I say. I was so selective in who I even wanted to see it, just because I uh, I I think at this point. You have to just pursue the vision in the purest way. And um, that's what I was trying to do. So anyway, thank you, Graham. I, well, I, I'm i honored. But Larry had been working on the script for, or just had a version of the script for almost a decade now, was it? Yeah. I think at that point. And so all of us Keepers, who've been, been through Glass Eye. What's yeah. that? Since Innkeepers. I had sent it first yeah. to Jacob and Peter. Yeah. I mean, it, we we all had been wanting to see this movie made for so long and uh, getting to finally see it and see not necessarily the, as Larry said, the scope of the original vision that he had, but the emotional scope completely real, fully realized in a way that was even having read it for like several times and thought about it for years still surprising like all the animations that you brought in from jane were just amazing like like added this whole new dimension to it and the the dips in and out of a type of uh, subjective uh stylistic uh quality 
I like bringing in the sort of like universal monster picture vibe at times and referencing that. Uh, it really, uh, it was great. I mean, it really was a delight to see a new, it's always a delight to see a new Fessenden picture. It, it made, uh, when I did my kind of top list out of Fright Fest last year, like it was in like top three for me. Um, genuinely, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass, like or anything. Uh, cause I, I think I haven't seen, a Frankenstein myth that I could relate to in a long time. Like it felt so grounded and so real. So, um, working, working man, working class, working class Frankenstein. Uh-huh. Um, it didn't feel as, it's funny because what you're saying about the scope, I don't know for not knowing any of that. I just felt like it was so relatable uh, to just me as an average Joe looking at these characters and kind of identifying with, several of them you know uh but yeah i uh, if anybody watching this depraved is available etc i believe at this point and just go check it out uh it's it's phenomenal uh and especially if you're a fan of frankenstein monsters and anything like that or just good emotional compelling drama (laughs) check it out thanks guys uh, and likewise, uh, Dead Wax is on Shutter. Uh, one of my favorite things I've seen today is that Graham had recreated the op- one of the opening shots from Dead Wax in Animal Crossing, which I thought was absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> the little, little things that are getting uh, into quarantine. That's, we we all need them, man. Animal Crossing. <laughs> Guys, uh, thank you, you both so you much. Talk to me last week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you both so much for taking the time to do this because as I say it's a new channel I'm just trying to get people interested and involved and uh, shine a light on some stuff and uh, yeah thank you guys so much for taking time out to really appreciate it thank you for having us Patty this is awesome really fun no problem So there you have it, guys. That was my interview with the incredible Graham Resnick and Larry Fessenden. Now, I want to be very clear here that I am a gigantic, gigantic Larry Fessenden and Glass Eye Picks fan. I was not. This is not me just saying it because Larry is on the show. I I am a huge fan of Larry's movies and of uh, everyone from Glass Eye Picks movies. I've loved uh, Jen Wexler is one of my favorite filmmakers. Uh, Eric Penikoff, who worked who interned at Glass Eye Picks, his film Sadistic Intentions is incredible. I uh, Graham's own Dead Wax, absolutely stunning. You know, I'm not exaggerating when I when I big up how much I love. I've always said I will not champion something unless I truly love it, and I love Larry. I love Graham. I love Glass Eye Picks. So it was beyond an honor and beyond a pleasure to do this episode of the show. And I hope you guys enjoyed it because, I mean, Until Dawn really has become uh, one of the most iconic horror games of the past decade, easily, hands down. Uh, So for me to get a chance to talk to two of the guys who were partially responsible for that game's existence, just blows my friggin mind i'd love to get the chance to eventually talk to someone from uh supermassive games like pete samuels because i am fascinated by supermassive games and what they do i'm not going to waffle on too much longer i just want to thank you for sticking around for the interview it was an absolute pleasure uh to do this and share it with you so and as always if you're here for the first time and you just came to check this interview out and you're like you know what that was good crack please hit that subscribe button uh it's usually important it helps me out massively and encourages me to, to want to keep doing this i just hit my milestone of 200 subscribers uh recently and i appreciate every single subscriber who hits that button i'm not joking when i say that either uh i am i i really really do every time i see though like that there's more people involved it just makes me feel like yeah, this has been such a worthwhile venture to, to bring this community of survivors together. So yeah, please hit subscribe. And also check out Until Dawn, Until Dawn Rush of Blood, uh, The Inpatient, Hidden Agenda, and Man of Medan, uh, for And all the amazing movies, Depraved, uh, Dead Wax on Shudder, uh, Habit, Wendigo all of the amazing uh, films and then all as we say all the Thai West stuff please give them your love and your support because they are talented incredible people that deserve it 
I'm going to leave it at that, guys. Look, with the way the world is right now, this really is a genuine one coming from the heart. Uh, let's survive together and peace out. First, the Wendigo. He'll render you immobile.